We begin the service this morning. We'll sing number 28. I will sing the wondrous story. That is a wonderful story, and I hope we all understand the truths in that story and understand the power 
that is in that story, the wonderful story of Jesus Christ, our Savior, that God loved us, you and me, and all the other members of Adam's family here upon the earth, how he loved them so much that he sent his son here. And that's that wondrous story. How he hung on Calvary. And how he overcame all things here upon the earth for us. So that we can have salvation today. We can have eternal life. And that's available to all that accept him. To all that repent of our sins. And has faith in Jesus Christ. And accepts him as our savior. So let's give him this morning the thanks and the honor and the glory for all that he has done for us. And that we've been able to come out this morning. And I hope that our mind is in a position, in a, in a way that we can understand and we can receive the spiritual meat that he'll have to offer to us today. That we may be able to grow spiritually. You know, we've talked a lot about that recently. And each week as we come out, how do we feel? Do we feel as though that we're growing spiritually? Are we moving up? Or are we just kind of going back? I know that he is there for us. And I know that we can have power over Satan in every situation if we put it into the hands of the Lord. And I know that if we will put our life into his hands, he'll be able to direct our thoughts and our words and our deeds so that then that we will be able to walk a good work, work here upon this earth, full of faith and letting that spirit, not our works, but the spirit of the Holy Ghost do the works within us so that then... Those works can be seen of others, not to bring glory upon ourselves, but he says, let your works shine, that others may be able to see and give God the glory. And when we think about what he has done for us, are we filled with peace this morning? Are we filled with hope? Are we excited about what the Lord is doing in your life? Are you excited about wanting to help to promote his kingdom here upon the earth? As I was just coming in this morning, coming to church here, I just noticed several signs wanting people to come and sign up for certain things. Most of it just... For it, sign up for to come and play sports for us, or to do this or that. And I wonder in my mind, it just came to my mind there. Are we putting the same amount of attention to helping our young people, our older people, our middle-aged, to whoever it might be? And I'm talking about our whole community. I'm talking about our state, our nation, whatever it might be. Are we putting the, enough, the same amount of effort into teaching and encouraging each one of us in eternal life and in salvation? And that's what is going to matter for us all. All of the worldly things that we might be involved in, all of the things that we might take pleasure in here will soon be gone. They are temporary But if we lose out in that, nat that spiritual part, that will be eternal. And if we can encourage and do the things to help someone see the need of putting it into the hands of Jesus. And if we can encourage them to put their life there. Look at what the rewards would be for them. And if we can see someone today help someone on their way 
their journey. And there may be someone struggling. There may be someone struggling here today, spiritually. And if that's the case, I want you to just put it into the hands of our Lord and Savior. And let me encourage you that he will be there for us. And there may be some dark, dry places that we have to go through here in this life. Others did. We can read about them here in this book. But those that put their faith and trust in our Lord and Savior, put their faith in him, and then they let their works show what their faith was. I was just reading again recently in Hebrews about faith and what all they did. But in every incidence, there was works in those things to back up that faith. And it was the works of the Spirit of God that was within those people that enabled them to have the right and the proper faith in what God could do for us. So it's a combination, friends, but I want us to all understand that it's not our works. If it's a good work, it's just like what the Lord said. He said if there's anything that's good, it's done by God. It's not Him, or it's not by us. It'd be the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. But we've got to walk with Him, and we can't just go out and live a life of sin and expect to be able to be with our Lord and Savior and His Father. We will make some mistakes along the way. But that spirit, that new man, and we have to become new, and we've talked about this a lot recently, that new birth, that spiritual birth. And friends, there may be people here that have been, that has been to this church or someone else, someone else for many, many years. But have you had the true spiritual birth? And that's the thing that we need to all be taking to the Lord this morning and making sure that we have received that and that we are a new creature and we're excited about what he is doing in our lives. When we read through in many cases there about what the Lord did when he, he would heal someone, they would be elated over what the Lord had done to them. And want to follow him in cases they would say they wanted to go with him on his journeys. There was times that the Lord told them, no, I want you to go back to where you came from. And tell them all about what Jesus has done for you. How you were healed. And that's what we need to be looking for today. And encouraging one another in his work, in the truth. And encouraging one another to come on and let's listen to him and let's show what this Bible has that lies before me and before you. The wonderful words of life that is in it for all of those that want to see it. But remember also that he said that there is a road. There's two roads. There's one that is wide. And there is one that is narrow and there's one that has a straight gate at the end and there's one that has a wide gate and he says that there is a few that would enter into that straight gate that enters into heaven but he said there would be many that was on that broad path that leads to destruction but each and every one of us this morning has the opportunity to be on that straight and that narrow path and we can stay there as long as we walk with him. So let's put it into his hands, friends, and let's walk with him today. And let's be encouraged in the work, knowing that he died for us. And that let's take our condition to him and be strong in his words. Be strong in the spirit.
when I read through and you read the letters that was written by Paul, by John, by Peter, whoever might wrote the letters, and we've opened here this morning, I've opened the Bible to Galatians, and we'll read there. This is the third chapter of Galatians. But when we go through and we read and we understand and see what that these men were full of the Spirit, you could see it in their writings. You could see how that the Spirit was directing them. And they were willing to share the good news with others. They were willing to encourage them in the work. They were willing to encourage them if they saw them in that things were not going as they should be in certain churches there, they were willing to point it out to the people so that because of the love that they had for them so that they could get it right with God and that they could have that eternal life. And Paul writing here to the Galatians, he had some very good and encouraging words, and we'll start here. At the third chapter, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Now I believe that he was talking to people here, that he had already set up this church there, and there was people there that had been and maybe were still walking in the spirit, there was people there that were backsliding. And he says, oh foolish Galatians. And if we are doing anything other than what the Lord is asking for us to do, or if we are believing anything spiritually that would not be in accordance with his word, we would be just as these people. And there was things that was going on there that, that he was not approving of. And he said, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Who has changed your mind from the truths that you were able to receive before? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And I believe that there was people there that was telling them that they had to go back and there were certain things and it was by works of the law that they were to be saved. But Paul just was bringing these things back to their attention. And he says, now I would learn of you. This only would I learn of you. Listen to me, he says. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? Or by hearing of faith. And I know that that's the only way. There is no other way that you and I can receive the spirit of the Holy Ghost. Except through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way friends. Except through faith. You can never do enough good works yourself. To secure eternal life. Never. You've got to have that faith to be able to receive the Spirit. But then when that Spirit comes in, and we may read some other places here today in Galatians that I believe that he points those things out to us. The only, this only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? He was just bringing it very plain and bold to these people because there was somebody there that was teaching a doctrine that was not in accordance with the word, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if there is any other doctrine except the doctrine of Je the gospel of Jesus Christ, do not accept it. He said, let it be a curse. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Are you now made perfect by going back and observing the things of the law? I believe is what he was talking to them in that day. And in our day, could you think that we can now be made perfect by our good works, by what we can accomplish of our own self? I'm not talking about what you can accomplish with the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about you and me. 
in our own natural way, there is no way that we can be made perfect in that flesh. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He says, how did these things happen? He says, when he that came and ministered to you the Spirit, when you believed upon Jesus Christ, and you received that Spirit, and worketh the miracles among you, and that's a great miracle that was, that was worked among them when the old man was taken out, that old Spirit and that new man, that new Spirit, come in. He says, and those, he therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The only way that they could receive that, remember, was by hearing that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I want you to think about on the day of Pentecost even there, of how that the people there, and we've talked about this a lot recently, but how that they were gathered together and all of a sudden they were all speaking the wonderful words of life and all of mankind could hear it in their own tongue and believe. They had faith that what they were hearing was the truth. Do you have faith that what is written in this Bible and what you hear here is the truths of God? He says now, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, he believed in God, he had faith in him, and he followed what God asked him to do. His works. If he had had faith and just said, okay, yes, I have faith that God has told me to do this, but I know that all I've got to do is sit here and not go about and follow through with what he asked for me to do, I have faith that he will take care of me. But that's not what Abraham did at all. Abraham, God spoke to him. He gave him a commandment of something for him to do, to take Isaac and go and sacrifice him at a certain place. And he, he followed through with that. And he went all the way to the point of ready to take his life. And God stopped him. Said Abraham. And when he turned around, there was the sacrifice. There was the lamb or the ram. But his works showed what his faith was. His faith, he had so much faith that he says, I know that God has promised that through this son, there would be people as many as the sands of the sea. There would be a great nation of people through this son. And he says, I know that he is able to raise him up out of the ashes. Now that's how much faith that he had in God. He had faith that he knew that God was talking to him. He knew the message was coming from him, God. And he knew that he had to follow him. And he had that faith. And he followed through. And he did, in the eyes of God, he had sacrificed Isaac just as much as he had gone through with it. But God stopped that. And he gave him the sacrifice to do. And that was his faith in what God did. He says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham and those that have that faith today. And he says that all the heathen, all of mankind would have the opportunity to have that faith and be saved through that faith, through the preaching of the gospel. 
of Jesus Christ. And that's what it takes is believing in the gospel. That's what it took the day there of Pentecost. And a few days later there when there was hundreds, thousands that were saved by listening and having faith in what he had done. What Jesus had done to come here to establish the law of grace. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now again, what they were doing there, they were under the works of the law, thinking that what they could do and follow the works of the law and what they did of their own self, they could be saved. But that would not work at all. And I want us to understand there is a difference in what your works are and there is a difference in what the Spirit of the Holy Ghost works within you is. There is a total difference in those things. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in the things that are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for that the just shall live by faith. And Jesus Christ came here to the earth to establish that. He fulfilled the law. And he established the law of grace. And he says that, but no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Because Jesus Christ came here to the earth that we might now be saved through him, through grace. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth upon a tree. Christ redeemed us from the law, he says. Now it is up to us to have faith in Jesus Christ and receive him so that we can have eternal life. That is our salvation is through him, through faith that he came here to the earth, through faith that he overcame Satan and everything, through faith that he died on that cross, through faith that he was risen out of the tomb and back to life here upon the earth. That is where that faith comes in and that's where it works in everyone that puts their trust in him. <clears throat> <clears throat> that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And what is the promise? What did he tell us? He said, I will go away. I'll go back to my Father. But I will send to you a comforter. I'll send to you a new Spirit. The Spirit of the Holy Ghost. So that then we can all be able to know Christ. And we can know the Father through Jesus Christ. He said, if you know me, you know my Father. And if you know my Father, your Father knows you. And he will send to you that spirit, that new man, through Jesus Christ, that then we can overcome Satan. And we can walk in his work here upon the earth. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Brethren, friends, he said. I speak after the manner of men. I want you to understand these things to all men. 
Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, if it be confirmed in God by God the Father and Jesus Christ, that covenant that is made through Christ with you, he says, no man disannulleth or addeth to. It is there for us. And it, he will not take it away. We might turn and walk and go away from him. But he will never leave us as long as we walk in his work. As long as we does have that desire for his spirit above everything else. Now, Abraham, now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. The, the law there has no effect upon the law of grace. And it cannot disannul that at all. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the, wherefore, then serveth the law? Why would you serve the law, he says, if the law has been, been fulfilled and then, then the promise is by God through Jesus Christ. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And the law was good and there was a purpose for it there. And it was to be able to instruct people. It was to be able to give them an opportunity to live so that that righteousness might be given to them that, that, that they may be saved by following the commandments and following the law there. But he says all of those things now have been taken away in the promise that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would come here to the earth. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. No, the law is not against the promises of God. God gave them the law. And God gave the promises. God let his son come and fulfill the law. God forbid, for if there had been a law given which should, could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But that couldn't happen. By the, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. And this is the promise. That there would be a Messiah that would come and all men would be able to understand, all men would be able to accept him that wants to be accepted. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe upon him. And now what was the promise? The promise was the spirit of the Holy Ghost, the comforter. Now do you believe that we can receive that spirit of the Holy Ghost, the comforter, and then just continue to go on and live in a life that we lived before. If we receive of that, he says, we're made new. Then the old man is out. And that new spirit then will direct us in a different life, a different way. We will not be in that sinful life that we were one time. If we have that spirit, we will be growing strong and we will be excited about what that spirit is doing within us. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto to the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster 
to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law was a schoolmaster. The way that the master there, he, the schoolmaster can instruct and tell people how to do this, this, and this to be able to get the desired effect. And that was what the law was doing there in the people, to do this and this so that God would have the desired effect in those people in that day. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. Now that we have received that faith, now we are under the law of grace. Now we are under the power of God through his son, Jesus Christ. And that spirit then will be able to direct each and every one of us. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. There it is, just as plain as it can be said. Now, you are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, if we are a child of God, What will that spirit and what will the child of God's life be here upon the earth? Will it be full of the carnal nature? Will it be full of carnal things? Or will it be full of godly things and a righteous nature? For as many of you as have been baptized unto Christ has put on Christ. As many of you as have been baptized unto Christ, and I believe there that, that is, there's two different baptisms. There's a baptism with the water so that you might show to all naturally that you are accepting Christ and that you are making that commitment to follow him. But then there's a baptism of Christ, the spirit of Christ. That is what will save all of us. We might be baptized with the water, but maybe never receive that spirit of the Holy Ghost. Never receive the baptism of Christ. That can happen and has happened. And he has warned us of all these. He says, there is many that will come to me. There is many that will come in that day saying, we have cast out devils in your name. We have done many wonderful works in your name. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. But there's others that will be able to stand there before him. And him say, enter into my kingdom with me. He says, for as many as you as have been baptized unto Christ has put on Christ. Now if we put on the spirit of Christ, again, will that lead us into the carnal things of this world? That the Lord would con has condemned. Will it lead us into that? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. That, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Isn't that encouraging to think about it? Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you came from what your background is. He says, there is, neither bond, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all in one, all one in Christ Jesus. And friends, I know that if we're truly walking with him, there is no division. We will be at one together in his spirit, just as he has says here, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You're part of the same seed there that righteous seed, Abraham, seed there. And that is a part of the 
true spiritual church of Christ that has been all the way along since he was here upon the earth. And there has been people that has been a part of that. And they will continue to be people a part of his spiritual church. It's not a natural church anywhere that's going to save you. It's being a part of that spiritual church and having full knowledge and full faith in what he has done for you and what he can do for you. Now this I say, that the heir as long as he is a child differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Just going back and just bringing these things to their attention. He was wanting to get them to renew their knowledge to renew what they had maybe lost part of that spirit. Just as in Revelations it tells there of how that you've lost your first love. I believe there was people here that had gone back into things that they should not be going back into. Paul was just warning them and showing them how that you need to get back on the road to victory in Jesus Christ. But when the fullness of the time was come, when the time came for God to send forth his son, for God to send the Messiah here upon the earth, God sent forth his son made of a woman, a virgin, that had never known man. But the Holy Ghost came upon her. She conceived and brought forth a child, Jesus Christ, made of a woman, made under the law. To redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoptions of sons. And we talked a lot about that over the years. How that when we receive that then we are then adopted and we are an heir with the throne of God with Jesus Christ. We are a son of God. And I want you to ask yourself that. If a son of God and he says I will send to you a spirit, not a spirit of fear, but I will send to you a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And that's what he will do here and that's what has taken place here when he sent that here. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Look at what it is now. He's gone back and he's just telling them now, to redeem them that were under the law, that you might receive the adoption of sons. That's why he sent his son, to redeem you from your sins. He paid the price. Now he just can't come to redeem us, to take care of us to all of those that accept him. And because ye are sons of God, and has sent forth the spirit of his son, he, God has sent forth, the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. And what is your heart crying? Abba Father, Master Father. Is that in your heart today, friends? I want us to all to understand how important this is for us to know. Paul was pleading with these people to understand that. And I am pleading today that we all understand this truly in our hearts. Has that spirit made you new? Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. An heir of God. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. And remember what an heir is. We see somebody today and he says, he is an heir to this big estate over here and we look at it and we think wow look what all they're going to receive but I want you to think about what was just read there 
How is it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods? But let's read that seventh verse there. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We're an heir of God. And what does that mean? An heir shares in the wealth of whoever was over that estate, whoever's it was. This is God's estate, God's kingdom. And he is telling us very plain and clear that we, when we receive that spirit, are there then an heir to that. And that we will be able to receive our portion of that. Our portion is eternal life, peace, happiness here upon this earth, and hope then of that eternal life through the spirit there that we have inherited when we accepted Jesus. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods, and that was with all of us. Before we repented, before we truly knew Jesus Christ, we did service unto those things that are by nature, and our nature, this carnal flesh that we have, the nature is, is to take us and to lead us into sin. To lead us into the things of this world. And he said you did service unto that. Your life was that way. My life was that way. Before we repented. Before we accepted Christ. But he says now. But now. After that you have known God. Or rather are known of God. How turn you again. To the weak and beggary elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. <coughs> Friends, that's just bringing it right straight down to the lowest point for us. And each and every one of us ought to be able to understand what he's talking about here. He says, now, after that you have known God, and then he changes, he says, or rather known of God. And think, how can, we know, how can we be known of God? We first have to know his son. We've got to accept his son. And then he says, then we will be able to know God and God know us that we talked about earlier in this service. This is what he's talking about here. And he says, now after you've known that, after you've accepted that, after you have seen the glory and the wonderful power of God. He says, how do you turn again unto the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desired again to be in the bondage? The things of this world, he's saying. The things of the, the sinful things here that you were involved in before you accepted Christ and look into our life, each and every one of you, and myself also, how wicked our lives were. And we deserved hell. But Christ died here on the earth so that we could overcome that and that he would forgive us of our sins. But then what does he say? We've got to turn from that. And now walk in the commandments of God. I believe last Sunday we read about how he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do the things I say if you love me. And if we've got that proper love here by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost within us, why would we want to go back into those weak, sinful things that we were now that we have had and been able to have power over. He says, why? And it just, whereupon you desire again to be in bondage to the things of this world, letting Satan put you in bondage to sin again. He says, why do you want that? 
why would we want that today? I know that if we will be strong in the Spirit, the Spirit will be telling us no. The Spirit will be screaming within us to stay away from that. Do not get involved in this or do not do this. Do not say that. Do not go here. This is what that Spirit then will be directing us. And it will not carry us back into the bondage of Satan. Now he goes on and he was talking about things in that day here as you'll see that they, had, they were trying to go back some of them into the things of the law. But that is just as much in effect with us today once we have had this body cleaned up. That spiritual body. We don't need to go back into anything of the things of this world that would be displeasing to our Lord and Savior. You observe days and months and times and years. He says, I am afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul had been there. He had worked with these people. He had helped them to be able to receive that spirit. He had seen that. But now he says, you are going back into the things there that I have taught you against. I've taught to you and told you that you don't need to, to do these things. You need to have faith in Jesus Christ. And you need to let that spirit then have the power to overcome Satan in you. And now he says, now you are going back into the house that you came out of. And friends, that can be just as much with us in our day as it was with them. He says, I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of the things that is going on. That's what Paul is telling them. And that can be right and is and will be right here within us. If we aren't walking worthy with him. He says, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am. For I am as you are. You have not injured me at all. And what they were doing was taking nothing away from Paul. But he was just encouraging them to be as I am. As I follow Christ, follow me. Brethren, I beseech you. Be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. That Paul came unto them and through tribulations, through whatever, there was things that was even in his flesh that was bothering him, but he continued to preach and to teach them. And my temptation which was in my flesh, you despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. And they should. And we have talked about these things before. If Paul was there and he was speaking the words of God, he was speaking the truths of the gospel, it was the same as an angel of God that was speaking those things. And that is the same way it will be with us today, friends. If it is the truth and it's coming, whoever might be speaking those things, it is the same as an angel of God speaking those words to you. And that's what Paul wanted them to do wanted everybody to understand that that is how important it is for us to be able to discern the truths and accept the truths and reject the antichrist and my temptation which was in my flesh you despise not nor rejected but received me as an angel of God even as Christ Jesus where is then the blessedness you spake of for I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and had given them to me. I believe Paul saw that when he first taught and he gave them the truths, they accepted it and they accepted him as being a servant of Christ. And that's the first thing we all have to do today is accept Christ and then accept whoever he is speaking 
his words through as a servant of Christ. And that can be you speaking to somebody. It is my job to speak to this congregation. But you can be just as much a servant of Christ as me or anybody else in this room. And be able to speak the truths so that others might be encouraged in his work. Just as Paul was doing it there in that day. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And is that the case today? Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The truths that are written here in this book. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected. Always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you. He says it's good for you to always to be zealously affected. When the truths are taught to you. If it steps on your toes or whatever. If you accept it. Be zealous in that. Because that's a good thing he says. But he says, not only when I am present pe preaching, preaching these things, let that spirit do the same thing within you and be zealously affected by the spirit, what the spirit is telling you. Be zealous in the work. Be strong in the work. Be willing to just lay aside our will and our way and to walk with him. My little children of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. Now listen carefully what he was saying. and He didn't just down blast them. He said, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again, he says, I want to talk with you. I want you to understand. I want to work with you and teach you Until Christ be formed in you. What can I do this morning? That can help someone on their way. So that Christ will be formed in your spirit. That you'll be made new. you have that new birth. This is what Paul was speaking to these people. And how he was just so earnestly pleading with them. To turn from these weak and beggary elements of the world. And to be strong in his spirit. He says, I desire to be present with you now. He knew that these things were taking place. And he says, I desire to be there so I can look at you. So that I can, you can see the concern I have for you. And the love that I have for you. And to change my voice. To be strong in it. To let them see the Spirit working within him. For I stand in doubt of you, he said. And I want you to be strong. I want you to understand today. I want to be just as he, he was there. I want to work and do whatever I have to do, what I can do, to help each and every one of us here be sure that Christ is formed in us and that new birth is there. And I have a desire, a true desire, to be present with you now here today or in any time, wherever it might be. And to be able to talk, be able to encourage to put it into the hands of Jesus Christ. For there is things that I stand in doubt of. And there are things here today that I stand in doubt of. That are we all at one with him? Are we all Willing to just lay it aside. Lay the things of this world. Anything that's displeasing to him. Lay it aside. And move up friends. Tell me. Ye that desire to be under the law. Do you hear the law? 
And that would be today, tell me, you that desire to be under the carnal things of the law, what do you hear of the carnal things of the world? Do you hear that coming from the Lord? Is that what the gospel is of Jesus Christ? To let the carnal things of this world be what takes up all of our time, what takes up our mind, what we talk, we breathe, we encourage people in. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by bondmaid, the other by a free woman. He did, he had two sons. But he that was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he that was of the free woman was by promise. Now what is it within us today? Are we born of the free woman? By the promises of Jesus Christ, have we got that new birth? Are we born of the bondwoman? Born in sin. Each and every one of us that is here today was born in sin. We were born in bondage to Satan. But we've got the opportunity to be born from that free woman. To be born from, of Christ. The spirit of Christ. And being made free, not in bondage to Satan any longer, and never to be in bondage with him anymore, as long as we'll walk with him, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is agor. For this agor is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. And that's that spiritual Jerusalem. That's the spiritual Israel that is free from all Satan. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. We are the children of promise. And there are many more upon the earth there that are children in bondage to Satan, the way I look at that. But there is a husband there, God the Father and Jesus Christ. They make up that spiritual church, and then we can be a part of that. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Are you a child of the promise of God? But as then... He that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, so it is now. And he that is born in the flesh, the Spirit of Satan, will persecute the Spirit of righteousness. And there will be warfare there. He says that the Spirit of the things of this world, he says, are an enemy to the Spirit of God. And there will be warfare with the righteous. And let me tell you, Satan wants to get right in the middle. He wants to destroy the righteous. He wants to destroy you. Use the power of God to overcome him. He says if we resist him, he says you resist Satan. And he has to flee. Because he has no power over God. He says, draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. That's what God is talking to us about. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. And, and friends, none of us that is in bondage to Satan will be able to enter and be a part 
and be bound with Jesus Christ and God the Father. He says, cast out the bondwoman. The son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free. Now, who did he say a while ago? He says, now you can be adopted as a son and be an heir with Jesus Christ unto the kingdom of God. And here he's telling us that those that are not adopted into that kingdom will not be an heir. Those that have not accepted Christ will not be an heir in the kingdom of God. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And that's where I want to be today. And I know we've got that opportunity to be free and not be a part of being bound with Satan here upon the earth. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Listen carefully to that. Stand fast, he said, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, in the liberty that he has given to us when we are free from sin, to live our lives here and to be able to walk with him, Jesus Christ, and be not, he said, entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Be not again go back into the house that we came out of. He says, don't let that happen because then you will be in bondage again. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ hath no profit in you. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Again, he was going back. And Paul was using that. He was warning them about those that was going back and saying you had to follow the law. And I want us to all be warned today to let's don't go back into the things of this world that he has warned us so carefully about. He says there that Christ, if we do those things, he says, Christ shall profit you nothing. Isn't that a terrible thing to think about? That what Christ come here to the earth for and how it can be so profitable to us. He says, if, if we go back into that yoke of bondage with Satan again, he says, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified of the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And that's what I want us to all to have in our minds today. And have that hope. And have full faith in him. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. He says, you, whether it does not matter in those situations, the things that the law said that you did in those days, or if you don't do it in, those, uh, in the day now. He says, that makes no difference about how you receive Christ. He says, but faith, which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You started out well, he said. Now who hindered you that you're not obeying the truth today, he says. Who? And is that in our life? Examine it carefully, friends. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven and leaveth a whole lump. A little bit of the Spirit of God there 
can take care of things and it can make it can make you rise spiritually. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution for the offense of the cross ceased? I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Paul was very strong about that. He said that those people that trouble you in things that are not the doctrine of Jesus Christ, he says, I wish they were cut off. For brethren, you have been called into liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then. Walk in the Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now look. It says walk in the Spirit. And then that spirit there will lead you away from the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted after the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. He says they're contrary. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the spirit of God. He says there's two different things there and they, were, they will not mesh. He says so that you... You with the Spirit of God cannot do the things that this flesh would have you to do. You've got to steer clear of that. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And he goes through a whole bunch of things there. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness. Last seven is idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, how can we believe that we can say we're saved? How can we believe that we can say that I am walking with thee and then be involved? And he's saying you can't is what he's saying. But the fruit of the Spirit, he says, now if you've got that true birth, that new birth, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness temperance against such there is no law and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions and lust now that's what that new spirit will do for us it will crucify the flesh and all the lust there that this wicked body had within it before we received it that new spirit will crucify that. Take it away. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. If we live in the spirit, if we proclaim that, he says, let us walk in the spirit. Now let's do a work that shows that spirit. Let that spirit walk and do the, the work within us. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, friends. But let's give the glory and the honor to God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Because who are we? As we have read here today, there's nothing that you and I can do to save our mortal soul except have faith in Jesus Christ. And then when we have that faith, then we've got to accept him as our Savior. 
And when we have that, we've got to repent and ask for forgiveness of our sins. All three of these things has to happen very closely so that then we can receive of that spirit of the Holy Ghost. And as we have talked about, and he has made it very plain and clear today, then that spirit within us will do a work that leads us away from the carnal things of this life. It will lead us away from adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, all of the things that he mentioned there. And that spirit then will have within this body love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, meek, temperance. Against such there is no law. And all these things, now go back, Paul, you can look, people might say, well, Paul, you are not demonstrating these things. You've been pretty bold and pretty strong in pointing out some things to people <laughs> in this. But that just showed what the love that he had for them was. So that they might see their mistake and gain eternal life. Let us accept the word of the truth. And let's put it into the hands of the Lord, friends. He is encouraging us. And he has given us strength. He's given us knowledge and understanding of where to go. So that we might be able to overcome Satan here in this life. And we might be able to be filled with his spirit and have eternal life, inherit eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We'll sing today in closing number 194, Prepare to Meet Thy God. And there may be someone here that might would like to make that commitment. And you can do so as we sing number 194. You can come forward. Prepare to meet thy God.
said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. And I'll point you to him today. And let's be sure that we are prepared. It is all laid out for us right in this book. And if we have that faith, the right and the proper faith, and have a true desire for the love of Christ, we can be prepared. And we can stand before him at that final day with confidence and to be able to hear those words, enter you in to my kingdom. Let us pray. To God the Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, we just beg for guidance. We know that without you we are weak, but I know that we can be strong. And I know that that spirit of yours is available to us all. And Lord, we just beg that in the upcoming days that you give us knowledge and strength and understanding of what you'd have for us to be able to do to help to promote your kingdom here upon the earth, to clean us up from head to foot so that we can be victorious. And if there's anything that needs to be cleaned out just as it was there and the children of Israel there right there before they went into the town. But there was something that kept them from being victorious. But you cleaned it up. And then they were able to go and be victorious. Just as you had promised. And I know today that your promises are good. And Lord, show us what you'd have for us to do with the things that you've entrusted into our hands, both naturally and spiritually, so that we can help to encourage others in your work here on the earth. Thank you for all you've done. And be with those who are struggling this morning to comfort them and to help them to be able to move up and to be filled with your spirit and peace and hope and happiness. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.